Hello, everybody. This is episode 98 of the Agile podcast, and today is a landmark, not numerically, but we've got our first ever patron guest. So from our lovely patrons who support us, we've taken someone, a volunteer, and they are going to be our guest ale on this show. We've got Gareth, Gareth Thomas from Lincoln. And we spent a good time talking about technical stuff, which for me and Paul is a bit of a stretch, as you know, but Gareth is a very technically minded organizational leader. So we talked about different levels of testing. We talked about how we might help get people to see the value in test first. We talked about leading and lagging indicators, the short term and the long term focus. We talked about how that impacts on sustainable pace. We talked about something to do with Japan and making things out of metal. Very interesting. We hope you enjoy it. And if you'd like to be in with the chance of being a guest on a future episode, then become a patron. And every now and again, you'll be invited to have a chat with us live on the podcast. Speak to you soon, everybody. Take care. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Paul. We are very lucky today. We have a guest. <laughs> guest ale in the bar. Yes. What's, what's, on, our... what's on special offer this week? Well, I've got Ribena. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello, I'm Gareth. <laughs> hey, Gareth. Gareth's one of, Gareth, one of our patrons, our, um, our lovely patrons. So if this was a regular bar... Gareth would be basically keeping us in business. <laughs> he would have his own. He would have his own seat. At He'd the have bar. his own seat and probably his own tankard hanging from the uh, from the roof. He'd come in and he, he he wouldn't. He'd get his own glass. Absolutely. Cheers, Gareth. Nice to see you. You too. Whereabouts up. are you? Lincoln. Um, Lincoln. Somewhere in England. So. For because we have a global audience, do you want to give uh, give our global listeners a bit of a clue as to where Lincoln is it's it's if you look at the big map of the UK there will be some major cities in the middle and there are some bits on the right hand edge where nobody ever goes that's Lincoln <laughs> so sort of east coast not particularly north yeah although they uh, think they're northern here yeah and it's an um, hour from the sea but and that was, that was going to be my next question how close to the coast are you an hour yeah, you you know this, you know this, but our listeners probably don't. My grandfather used to play football for Lincoln City, so I used to have a Lincoln City football scarf when I was probably about single figures years old. Probably the only person outside Lincoln. And uh, Lincoln were they weren't particularly good, but he did he did nearly join Derby. He was some Derby tried to buy him for five pounds, I think. <laughs> which at the time was a lot of money as they always say but anyway enough of that um are you, are you actually drinking ribena uh actually it's hot robinson's ribena type stuff uh, type stuff okay it's mixed fruit berry drink yeah. is this to ward off the cold uh, it's been a long day uh, okay. i didn't sleep so if i have alcohol okay. i'll be asleep at the end of this <laughs> Well, that could still happen because Paul's here. <laughs> but if it was Ribena, I was going to give you another interesting fact about myself, is that, when, again, when I was single figures years old, I don't know whether you know this, Paul. This might be a, a fact that you don't Add know. Add it to the list. Yeah, go on. Do you know anything about me and Ribena? No, I don't think it's ever come up, come up in conversation. Okay, I nearly turned diabetic by drinking so much Ribena. <laughs> oh, I think you have told me that before. Okay. You had a mild, a mild addiction, didn't you? Yeah. I used to drink it very, very, um, very concentrated as well. So it's a black currant flavored drink for anybody else. You didn't used to drink it neat, did you? No, but but sort of fifty fifty, which is quite um, half yeah. a glass of Ribena cordial and half a glass of water on top. I think uh, when I was at rock bottom, that's that's pretty much what it was. <laughs> rock bottom. Uh, I bet wow. your mother that hated you. <laughs> that's that's expensive. It is expensive. Yeah, must have ruined your teeth. And as not, well. Yeah, not great for the teeth, but I have lovely teeth. So uh, what's the moral there? 
No. Rotten and early. Get a good second set. Drink, drink, drink fruity drinks responsibly, kids. So now I don't drink Rabina. I drink uh, a, a, a stout. I've gone for a stout today, Paul. Nice dark drink there. Um, oh, la- yeah, it's called Last Minutes and Lost Evenings. For another one from my local Daya Brewery. Uh, last minutes and last evenings. It's very dark. Business, Jeff. I don't think they need me, mate. They're doing very well. <laughs> I've got um, uh, just plain old Thatcher's hay. It's, uh, it's very boring. It's the only thing I've got in the fridge right now. But mm-hmm. it's um, it's fruity. So, cheers. Fruit. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Yeah, this one's, I would describe as sort of burnt chocolate. <sighs> what a lovely description. Well, I quite like that. I, I quite like a dark chocolate rather than a milk chocolate. Um, it's mm, a drink, though. It's, yeah, if I wouldn't have wanted this earlier on in the day because it was quite warm today, but now it's sort of a nice, coolish evening, dusk, um, and it's it's pleasant, it's nice. A few marshmallows, some squirty cream. <laughs> Maybe not, it's 8%. Woo! Straight to bed after that, then. Well, we'll see. We'll see. So, how's your day been, Gary? You say a long day, hard day, or is it just because you didn't sleep last night? Uh, it's been first day back in the office, actually. So physically actually, back in the office. Actually, in the office. Yeah. So we've been planning our year-end activities. So it's I work in the education sector. So the yeah, it, we got our sort of end of year presentations on Thursday. So coming together, planning out what that looks like, writing slides, working out stats to present. Mm. And how was it back in the office? Well, there's only four of us in a place where it's normally 50, so it was quite socially distant. <laughs> but odd. It was very echoey, very nice. Yeah. But Anything left in the fridge? No. We had one man work the entire lockdown there because he hasn't got anywhere to work at home. So okay. he's worked his way through all the leftover stuff. <laughs> Keeping the plants alive. Yeah. All the dev's desks are just covered in plants now. <laughs> are there plans soonish to bring people more people back in the office, Gareth, or, or not? Uh, 1st of August, we're thinking of starting to let people choose to come back in. But we're quite packed, so it's very difficult to get them everyone back in and have decent social distancing so it's yeah gonna be a sort of a phase return and i think that'll be harder than being fully remote i think a few people and a few people not will really divide the team up it'll really be an odd dynamic to manage so hmm. how was your meetup group paul oh it was very very meaty a very meaty uppy no it's good i've done i've been mr meetup this last um last two weeks two You've been getting two around weeks, haven't you two weeks two meetups I was at Agile Northeast this time last week, and I was at um, Agile Bath in Bristol today. That is one of the good things. I mean, it's a um, a benefit. I, I know there's, there's lots of drawbacks to what's happened, and we've talked a lot about that about about those things. But people, you know, from Germany um, turn, turning up turning up to uh, meet up technically that's uh, listed in Bristol. So it's fantastic, isn't it? That I, I'm meeting people that I probably would never have met on. Um, on Zoom meetups. No, being able to turn on a Zoom meeting with 15 minutes to go before you start is quite it's quite nice. I'm in a very weird position. For the first time in my adult life, since I was 17 years old, I do not own a car. <laughs> I know Gareth doesn't own a car. No. So you're the only one of us that owns a car, Paul. I know. Well, I, I don't see myself needing to travel for work for a long time. My main so clients aren't you, back you've, into You've got to kind of leave time. it. You're not, you've got no plans to replace it. Not, not at the moment, no. My clients aren't... Um, they're committed to not going back into the office until at least next year. Mm. Um, and I, I'm not... I, I think they will eventually. But I did... I was speaking to somebody yesterday who said, no, they, they've already given up the lease of their office. They've decided they're not going to go back. Um, they're, absol- they're absolutely fine working remotely. Because that's surely that's going to become an issue. Certainly, central London, isn't it? With um, offices, spaces that companies won't be able to afford. It's not worth them paying their lease, and they'll just well, become empty. 
Well, the well, Shard course. and Canary Wharf are quite worried about it, aren't they? Are they? Yeah, because they've had a few people serve notice because they've realised they can work perfectly fine without having an office in the 12th floor of the Shard. Yeah. And you can only imagine how much that costs. I do mm. quite a lot of work with the Greater Lincolnshire Enterprise Partnership, which is as exciting as it sounds. <laughs> and, and the... Uh, Estate agents have seen a massive uptick in places like Grantham and Newark, which are an hour by train from London. Yeah. Because people now go, we don't need to live in London. We don't have to commute all every day. So we're buying houses in walking distance of Grantham Station. Hmm. Yeah, it should. It should level out the UK socioeconomic divide mm. a little bit, I think. Yeah, I think even the UK government's thinking about relocating for a while up, up north somewhere, isn't it? Leeds, I heard Boris Johnson was suggesting. They've said that for years, haven't they? Though? So. But I think they're actually, because they have to, the, like the houses of parliament are falling down, aren't they? <laughs> Is it, I mean, it's actually unsafe to use them, I think, almost. So, uh, yeah. Um, all right. What about uh, what about the world of Agile? Has anything been happening in the world of Agile? Have you uh, read anything interesting or... Listen to anything interesting? I had a question. I was going to try and read it to you now. But then, um, well, you've been asked a question. Or yeah, it's a, it's a, tacky, a, it's a tacky question. It's a tacky question. Okay. Um, in the XP, oh, I'll just read it verbatim. Uh, in the XP world, do you find that the continuous refactoring of code breaks a lot of the automated tests, and therefore there is a substantial work amount of work in keeping these up to date? My team moans a lot about wasted effort in the rewrite of tests. They're doing it wrong. Absolutely. Okay, I'll just write, <laughs> make a note of that. Well, if they're breaking tests, then that's the the point. That is the point of the test. The catch is the catch breakage. So, if the test is breaking unexpectedly, that's indicating that they've refactored it incorrectly. So, you don't fix the test; you fix your code to so the test passes again. Hmm. That's the point of the code. Hmm. But I think the yeah. So, seeing it as as um, a cost. Seeing as, because it is a slightly more, well, is it an inefficiency in trying to actually write tests and write and rewrite tests? Because if we're actually rewriting tests, it may well be a good thing if, if they're going to be improved, surely. Well, there's, I'm thinking now, there we go. So... Yes, we need more of that on the Agile podcast. We need more thinking. <laughs> this is serious chat. This is serious yeah. chat. Your, your tests are your safety gates. They're the thing that protects you from releasing broken code. They're the thing that yeah. stops you putting into live a thing you don't understand. Hmm. Yeah. So your test failing is good because it's core to bug. And if you've got a bug in live, it means your tests were bad and you should refactor your test and work out the, what test you actually needed to catch that bug back yes. before you wrote it. Yeah. So you, you should be investing time in tests. But if in the normal run of work, you're breaking tests, that implies a deeper issue in your practices because you probably got too much coupling. You probably got to domestic dependence between parts of the system. So you change code, you're breaking things downstream and yeah. all your tests are very dependent on data or the shape of your code. So your tests are wrong. So I probably look, further out, look at something in BDD, look at something a bit more abstract from the code and get into your sort of your testing onion if you're into that sort of thing. I'm trying not to get way too geeky because you know I can. So, But but in terms of certainly, it's a continuous attention to that testing element on every day of a sprint, surely. It's not something yet we should try and... Because I a major gripe with me, and I won't name names, but some of the people used to work at Nokia there, um, they would not, say. Not Ian. No, well, Ian didn't work at Nokia, did he? But, um, he worked there must have been Ian at Nokia. <laughs> there was plenty of Ians, but um, let's call him Craig. Okay, okay. this one we'll call him Craig. Uh, he used to say, "Ah, oh, so he said uh, end of the sprint's coming up." He said, uh, "We got, we got." It's kind of I finished my task now. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go and write some unit tests. That it was a, it was seen <laughs> it was seen Gareth for for the for the benefit of the tape Gareth just put his head in his hands um, <laughs> so it was seen as a a frivolous kind of task that I will fill up some time it's like you know tidying up your bedroom or whatever but instead of seeing it as a 
a proactive it was something I'd do just to make it look like I'm busy at the end of the sprint and, and take up some time that used to really get my goat at the time and they're probably completely worthless as well yeah they're probably tests but, to have coverage <laughs> but in terms of metrics what they would be what was observed and what was measured was if their unit test coverage if they had lots of unit tests didn't matter how good they were it was just it looked good it looked good on the balance sheet right so on the dashboard I memorably on one day reduced test coverage on one co-base I was uh, working on by 57% <laughs> because I started making some changes. All the tests broke. And then I looked at the tests and they were just there to get coverage. They, yeah. You could write tests in such a way that it just looks like the code's working. It doesn't actually test anything. Yeah. And I thought I can either spend three weeks rewriting all the tests or I can bin them, yeah. stop lying, and then actually put a meaningful test in and then write my code hmm. because I'm of the school where you write your test first yeah, and then you prove your test. You've just got your red, green refactor. You it's a continuous cycle of writing code until your test passes. And then once you pass your test, you stop writing code yeah. and then you do you still find more. that, do you still find that difficult to, to convince people about? Yes. Well, the, the idea of test first. And and why what what do you think? Because you've been you've been doing this for a while. What do you what do you think is the sort of mental or, or cognitive stumbling block for people? It feels like a waste. Going back to the original question, you want to crack open your editor and start writing code. You want to start solving the problem. A lot of people think in code, and going test driven, you start having to. St- to express your changes in the tests. So you have to think about the shape of your code in tests and start writing tests. And then you can start writing the code to prove your tests. Because it you it's almost like you have to think about the requirement first. If you go test first, you think about requirement, not around feature. So you start thinking about what the customer actually wants and how you how you would prove that you're doing what the customer wants, rather than how to make a thing happen on the computer. It's flipping so, the mindset. Yeah. So hey, as, as I was just to say, as as someone who you, you quite openly said you enjoy coding, you still enjoy coding. Um, do you see writing tests as something fundamentally different to coding? Depends on the test. So because to a non-technical person, to me, that's Jeff. That's Jeff, by the way. <laughs> very non-technical person to me tests <laughs> are still technical geek gobbledygook um and i know they can be bit they can be written in plain english i know but to me to me one of the i've always assumed that a developer thinks of themselves as wanting to write code and tests aren't code but the more test driven you are for someone who's non-technical you're still writing code. You're just writing the code in a test format. Yes. Is that too naive? It depends on the layer of the test. So you have multiple different ways of looking it in. And oh, there's a there's a really good scrum.org trainer up north, and I can't remember his name now. And he does a fantastic talk on the layers of testing and how you build it in. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll have to find his name. But he he talks about starting on the outside and having your requirements in test. You almost document your entire system mm-hmm, mm-hmm. using something like Gherkin, using plain English, that you have systems that can understand. So you say, like, writing a test in English. Not behavior-driven development, but sort of feature-driven development. So almost mm-hmm. as even a step further than behavior. That's old school. Yeah. And then you go in and start thinking about the behavior. So... So you go, I want an ATM machine. This is always mm-hmm. the classic thing. And then you go through and all the different things that it needs to do and the sequence of things in English that enshrines your product owners or your stakeholders' actual view of how the feature should work. And then you write another layer of tests under that, which proves that. And those are your unit tests. Mm-hmm. And each of them are slower. Each of them have more independence between other systems and each of them have more... S- complexity to them and are a slightly more fragile but they test less yeah and um, and your product owner should be thinking really at the outer side it's that mvp feature first what 
am I, what problem am I trying to solve? So I'm looking at features, what's the problem that we're trying to fix with this thing? And then as you move down the layers, you get more technical, and then the testing turns from being a proof of the, of the requirement to a proof of the code. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a success even, then. <laughs> even for Jeff, even for Jeff, that that's uh, you put that into words that even he can understand. What 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 uh, what light bulb uh, were you going to turn on there, Paul? With your well, I was just going to ask: Does great testing have to come from? Is it a, is it a mindset? It is a different mindset. I think developers can get there. So some of the best testers I know, which is now different to unit testing. That's the different skill now is actually your integration verification testing. Yeah. But the best tests, some of those I know, come from either a sysadmin or a development background. They know how to break the system. Uh, one of the practices that I quite like and it's very hard to get them to do is like pair programming, is pair testing. So you have your tester in your team and instead of them testing the code, when you go, I, this needs testing, you drag the tester over, he sits next to you, and you pair on it, and he breaks it in front of your eyes yeah. on your computer. <laughs> um, Does he come with a, with a pack of tissues? To... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, 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 some Glenn Fiddick and a, an arm around the shoulder. But, yeah. but it's it makes the developer think about testing on their machine because the sooner you break it the sooner you can fix it and the cheaper it is so you don't want your tester sat at the end of the conveyor belt waiting for all these things to come in and then raising tickets into the backlog and moving things left you want it breaking before it even gets to integration mm. so i think it is i think it is a very different mindset isn't it i remember using um, meetups this was a meetup group i did donkeys years ago but it was i think actually coincidentally the bath and bristol one but they did a testing meetup I think it was an, the Agile one. But they just used it as basically an opportunity for testers to um, get together and basically try and break core functionality in, in the major some of the major websites like Amazon and places like that and Google and try and see if they could just test the hell out of their live systems to see if they could find flaws in it and find gaps and holes in it. And would that them, be would that be a sort of badge of pride if they could? Yes. <laughs> and they is there? Do you think there might be something in a sense of pride from a development point of view? In that, why do I really need to write tests? I know my code will work because I'm good. They say the, the, it's writing tests is the distraction from writing code, and they often judge by how many tickets they ship. Yeah. And writing a test is often seen as a thing that prevents them from shipping tickets. Yeah. Okay. So is that something you've had to tweak in terms of perspective, you know, outcomes, outputs type thing? You have to change the duration of which you're looking because uh, well, I'm not sure if anyone, anyone from work will actually listen to this, but there we go. Um, at the moment, we're seeing quite a lot of defects because we are on high velocity and we're working on part of the system that has very poor test coverage. It's written in a framework you can't test with unit tests. So we put a lot of Selenium type automated tests in, which aren't as good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our defect rate is so high that we are probably having a P1 every two days over the last wow. couple of weeks just on, oh, this is broken, this has fallen over, school can't access this. And schools probably don't notice. But you see the rework and the amount of time we're losing to doing those tickets again. So it's not just how quickly I ship that ticket. It's how many times does it come back? How many times are we fixing it? Mm -hmm. And if you zoom out to look at over six months, teams with good testing ship more code. Mm. Yeah. How, how do we how do we get people to stop thinking about it? Because it's so, the short term is such a, a big pull, isn't it? We are short term hedonists at heart, human well, beings. You can knock your scrub now and go, well, that's why we plan you're planning on two week cycles and that's going to limit your view. And are we getting all our tickets done in that sprint? Yeah. So, so part of that's probably ah. the definition of done. Wow. There we go. Done but, or done, 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 done. Mm. Uh, but the, it's making the wider business take a step back and looking at what's shipped over a longer period, which comes back to what I've been doing today, really. What have you achieved in the last year in work? Mm. And, stop looking at the next month and start thinking about what have we achieved in the last year and 
and not plan this really short horizons and going, we need to have all these features out next week to meet this arbitrary deadline. Mm. It's a combination of leading indicators and lagging indicators, right? Because the, 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 the long-term thing, you're not going to see the results, obviously, for a while. But to know that you're going in the right direction, you have some proxy metrics. Test coverage is one, things like that. Um, but you, you know, to having that longer-term horizon in conjunction with the short-term speed and re reactiveness that reactive nature that scrum can give you is is what we need we need that kind of balance don't we yeah it's it's how it's you're having multiple feedback loops mm -hmm. it's in my previous life i was a process control engineer and you and you have your slow feedback loop and your fast feedback loop and you have proxy metrics to enable to control the fast one but you still need to measure the slow and the fast to know where you're going and if you're on the right bearing and mm. it's um, I've got, I got, I was going to ask one thing, and it's kind of related. And it was a question that came out on this meetup group tonight. Is, is, and the question was, my team is, is, is experiencing high stress situation now because of the lockdown situation, because there's a, there's a tendency that we need fixing to fix things fast and how much that current, the current lockdown COVID type environment has probably focused people on the short term of, of to finding a fix now and trying to find resolution quickly because we don't like this whole world of uncertainty we're living in, especially if you're in the product development area. The need for any sense of stability is, is a positive. And she was really struggling with, how do I can't, basically, how do I slow and calm my team down because they're highly strung just because of the situation? Is that... Is it, have you seen that, Gareth? Is that, is that, has, the, has the environment played out on how teams are developing at the moment for you? Well, we're probably in a slightly different industry to everyone else. Uh, everyone will say that. But obviously, we work with schools. We do the management systems that run the schools. So yeah. coming into the lockdown, we had a really high stress time because it became obvious that the government didn't know how many children were in school. And we had to very, very rapidly release a lot of code with like a day's notice to record things for the department to allow schools to work out how many kids are in school mm -hmm. and why they are locked down. We turned around all the government's um, guidance in about four days, which required quite big system changes so we've been having these massive periods of frenetic activity in quite a load code base because it was in some of the older parts of the system as well, but to make it so that schools could go back and they could record mm. their bubbles and they could do track and trace within schools. And that's actually brought the teams together. We've had this really productive, really bonding experience because there's high stress, yeah. but high rewards. High, high purpose, yeah. Yeah. I mean... At one point, we were probably the canonical source of data and the number of children in UK schools because yeah. the government don't have it, we do. And we were writing BI reports to give to this, the department showing aggregate school numbers. And then I was seeing them reported on the BBC. You know, this is what the numbers that the government were using. Yeah. And it created a massive sense of pride in the team that we were making a real difference. But then there's a massive deflation because then you're doing... And now we're just doing something to make money. We're just doing yes. a product, and now it doesn't feel as exciting. I, I think it's interesting as to how the current environment has has galvanised or, in, in some cases, stressed teams out in terms of, oh my god, we have to do this now and increase the pressure. Because that can be inspiring, but it can be frightening. I imagine. Well, as you know, I, I focus on language a lot, and you, know, you said that, oh my god, we have to do this now. And so for organizations with without a, it's not necessarily an altruistic purpose. I mean, you are a, you're a company that makes money. You're a for-profit company, Gareth, right? But yeah. the, what you're doing is, is actually contributing towards the national cause. It's contributing towards something that everybody can humanize and relate to and empathize with uh, because they all know people who have children. They, they've all been to school themselves. Uh, and so they can see that they're actually solving a problem that's quite close to, to them as a human being. And that, 
that galvanizes. That's something they want to do. Yeah, they're being paid to do it, but they also want to do it. But if there isn't that sort of connection, if there isn't that humanized factor, then it is something that they have to do. And that becomes an obligation, a chore and a, and a, and a source of stress. And that's, for me, one of the big areas that, that affects the big, uh, almost invisible um, factors around sustainable pace. So, well, Gareth has described what Gareth is describing there, the amount of energy going in from that team for something that was what the country and families and schools and society absolutely needed at that point of time would have been absolutely unsustainable for the team that's stressed because they have to do something very, very quickly. But for that team, it was actually energizing. It was bonding. Um, and that's, that's a massive thing for me. The, the interesting is the response maybe from people outside the team. So you got, you know, you get a lot of praise coming in and everyone's amazed at what they're shipping, but then you get people going, why can't they do this every sprint? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. We're talking like one day sprints. We're literally sprint planning in the morning and then reviewing at lunchtime and then shipping yeah. in the afternoon again. But Everyone's heard the story of the, of the mother who will lift up a car because it's it's crushing their child. They they have that that temporary moment of of superhuman strength. So why can't you do that every day of the week? Because that's not happening every day of the week. If it did, it would become normal, and it wouldn't be as. But it does. Compelling. It does create. I know what Gary was saying. It does create an expectation. Well, if you've done it once, surely you can. The the, the impossible has become possible, right? Yeah. And. Um, this makes me think of um, Japanese tin plate works. I haven't had a okay. steelwork story. And in Japan, they have pride around their production records on their lines. Okay, yeah. So Nippon Steel will see shifts come in on their own time on downshifts to set new records. So they'll come in, they'll have thought about how they're going to operate in a more precise way to do higher quality or more steel in a shift through a five stand reduction mill. I don't worry what one of them is. And they will <laughs> and they will go in and then they will work that shift and set a new production record. And then that becomes the new metric for the line. I mean they, they see the quality of the product that goes out the door. They are proud to give it to the customer. And they are proud of having an efficient shift. They're proud of shipping code in a sustainable pace. So the important thing about them coming in is they'll think about how they're going to operate and they don't flog themselves. They'll put a new process in. They'll, in, they'll inspect and adapt and they will do a another shift which is slightly better than the shift before, to, but they'll trial it and they'll do it themselves because they know that the company will be better for it and they get a sense of pride in the company doing well. It's a, it's a completely different mindset though. So. I got to know about Nip Nippon because I worked on a joint working group with uh, British and Chi sorry, Chinese and J Japanese cold reduction steel mm -hmm. systems. And pride's probably the wrong word. It's it's, it's ownership's probably the better better way to think about it. So they they're not competing with anybody but themselves, mm. and they're not trying to do better than the other five stand mill because there is usually only one in the works, and they're not. And they're not competing with the upstream or downstream units because that doesn't make sense. I mean, they consume one's things from one unit and they give it to the next. Uh, and the quality of their work reflects down the, down the path. So I suppose there's pride in giving good things to your colleagues, but not like we're the best, but in a we're giving you good work. Mm -hmm. And pride or satisfaction in being able to cope with what's coming from the stream you going at this new metric means that the line below can run faster because that's been upgraded. They can do this work. So now you're not bottlenecking them. It's your mm. theory of constraints with your EUI you know, gold rat. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, that, that's that's really interesting. I mean, I, I, I've seen a lot of that in perhaps different circumstances, but that sense of beating your own personal bests. I have seen a little bit of, you know, inter inter company competition you know actually healthy most of the time it's it's unhealthy but sometimes it can be healthy competition into you know sort of setting the standard and another team re responding to it and that you know pushing the bar up internally but pushing your own bar up i see a lot of that um if you've got ownership and you can actually you, you know you've connected your values to the purpose of the work 
um, then and yeah, like, yeah, that ownership is quite key. I got asked the question, uh, and it was a little bit too technical, so I passed. But um, <laughs> it was uh, it was around um, whether the, the the more remote nature has made it easier or harder for teams to keep their quality bar high when it comes to sort of TDD pairing things like that. Um, and I have to admit, I didn't have any data to to say either way. Uh, my instinct would say it would probably be harder, but I imagine also for some teams it might be easier because there'll be fewer distractions. Yes. Have you have, <laughs> just like that? Is it? Uh, it um, depends. Depends on the person of the team. So we've seen. It's it's odd because you don't want to put the plans in place that we make this the BAU. Yeah. But some people have collaborated more. They've made more of an effort to always be on a meeting or be invested a lot in remote pairing software even before the lockdown yeah. and the team were quite used to doing that and everything's got pipelines and everything is you know, centrally stored and so you can ship your code you can see pipeline builds very very easily but other members of the team have just vanished in on themselves and we're making an effort to make sure who's in stand-ups and who's talking and who's being active and but I've just I've seen so I had a chat with a good uh, scrum master friend of mine who's adapt their team's adapted really well to the whole lockdown thing and there's a they use Google Hangouts and their their Google Hangout is open all literally all day we know we can see each other all day two screens so one with the screen that I'm working on but on the other one is the Google Hangout that's kind of open in, open all day and we just kind of we will just every now and again tap each other on the shoulder virtually or turn our microphone on and, and shout something that we need some help with something and similar with you gareth or is it is it is it more ad hoc when you need it you, you turn yeah. the cameras on it's we tried the all day and no one joined it because people we find people jumping into different meets to do their pairing yeah and they're not coming back in so it sort of fell by the wayside what we introduced was a lunchtime catch-up which was optional I'm more of a sort of a water cooler moment to come around and talk all day. Yeah. But we've always been big users of Slack. Yeah. And everyone is very vocal in Slack all the time, and they have been even in the office. And I think that's helped because our sort of collaborative work happens in Slack. Yeah. Even in the office, we'd all be sat there with our headphones on talking to the person next to you on Slack. <laughs> so it sort of just continues in the same in the same way. Um. I hate to hate to bring our chat to a close, but I'm I'm out. I think we're done. Yeah, I mean, that is our our leading indicator of whether we're done or not. <laughs> is I have an empty pint glass. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Gary. Yeah, it's I'm nice, sure it's our, nice to have a guest. Our listeners will be thrilled to hear someone other than just me and Paul for once. Um, so yeah, it was uh, brilliant. Thanks for making time, and thanks for being a patron. Obviously, cheers. Cheers to you, sir. Cheers. Ding, ding, ding. Until next week.